This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also more say, more control, more ownership? Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. Welcome back into Off the Pike and welcome into our FanDuel TV audience on the local angle as huge news for the Celtics as Kristaps Porzingis is now a member of the organization. So I do want to get into that part of the equation for the Celtics and why I do like the Kristaps Porzingis part of this. Now, clearly he's going to have to be really good for the Celtics. It's one thing when you're traded for Malcolm Brogdon. It's a totally different thing when you're traded for the former defensive player of the year and Marcus Smart, despite him not being the same guy last season, he does have a real reputation with the organization, considered to be a leader. So now I feel like there's more pressure on Kristaps Porzingis than there previously was, right? If you're traded for Malcolm Brogdon, it's one thing. Marcus Smart, you have pressure on you now. Kristaps Porzingis has to be really good for the Celtics team next season, and he has to be a game changer. Now, the good news is he was a game changer for the Wizards last season. So he really impacted their offense. If you look at it in terms of the offensive rating, this is via cleaning the glass, 117.7 offensive rating for the Wizards last season with Porzingis on the court. That was in the 81st percentile. That was a 6.4% increase with him on the court compared to off the court. That was in the 94th percentile via cleaning the glass. So the offense last season in Washington was really good with Chris Stops Porzingis on the court. Now, why was that? First of all, he did an outstanding job in terms of shooting threes last season. 38.5% on 5.5 three-point attempts per game. That's really good volume for a center. And secondarily, of course, 38.5% is really good numbers for a center. You look at the catch and shoot threes. 121 of 308, that's 39.3%. So that's an elite number. And obviously, he's going to get even more catch and shoot opportunities next season with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. The other thing is this. On his two-point shots last season, now this is something Joe Mazzulla may have to mix in, like, hey, Joe, this guy can actually score inside the three-point line. I know you don't like to do that, but you can try this with him. So if you look at his two-point shooting last year, career high at 55.9%. And why was that? Well, because his post-up game was really good. So if you look at his post-ups last year, he was 94 of 162. So obviously that's 58%. 1.18 points per possession. That ranked in the 89th percentile, okay? And the Celtics didn't post up at all last year. In fact, they were 24th in total in terms of post-up possessions per game last season. So now this is a new wrinkle that the Celtics can bring to the table because remember when you were watching the postseason and you were looking at the situation where the offense got stale, right? We can all acknowledge. I mean, part of the issue for the Celtics, their defense was not great in the postseason, but also... Their offense, we saw it two years ago and we saw it last year. It got static at times in the postseason. Part of that is Joe Mazzola, this 
reliance, over-reliance, I would say, on three-point shooting, especially going back to the Miami series when Miami was one of the worst teams defending two-point shots last season. The Celtics didn't dig into that. But think about this. When Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum at times are struggling, well, guess what you can do now? Hey, uh, throw it to the 7-3 guy that's down low. Throw it to the 7-3 guy that's on the block, which is a luxury that they didn't have. So it's just a different element. It's not like you're going to go down the court and your offense is going to be Hey, let's post up Kristaps Porzingis every time when you have Jason Tatum and when you have Jalen Brown, but it is a wrinkle that this offense previously didn't have last season. They don't post up Al. Rob obviously can't post up. He doesn't have any post up moves or anything along those lines. So it's a new element there. So the offense, what you have now is a spacer with Kristaps Porzingis at the center position. And what's big there is he legitimately is going to pull the big man out of the paint. So that also makes life easier for Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who All indications point to Jalen Brown eventually getting the Supermax. So those driving lanes are going to be easier, which is definitely huge for Jalen, who, of course, struggles turning the basketball over, struggles dribbling with his left hand at times. If Kristaps Porzingis can lift the guy out because they have to respect his shooting, it's obviously massive for the Celtics team. And then the other element is he gives you something you didn't have where he can score inside and it gives you sort of a third legitimate third option, right? Because you didn't really have a legitimate third option last year. That's what Kristaps Porzingis is from an offensive perspective. And I know other guys scored at times, but this guy, you know exactly what his skill set is. He can score in the post and he can threes. It's very valuable. Then you look at last year, the defense with Kristaps Porzingis. Remember, I get it. The Celtics were second last year in defensive efficiency, but what we saw in the postseason, routinely, They got absolutely shredded defensively. There's no way that anybody could have watched that Celtics team and said, hey, they were the same defensively as they were two years ago. No, they clearly dipped off. Miami exposed them, right? They got exposed by Atlanta at times. They got exposed by Philadelphia two years ago when the Celtics struggled. It was all about their offense. But last season, it was the defense at times in the postseason, too. So if you look at the defense last year, Kristaps Porzingis on the court, for the Washington Wizards. The effective field goal percentage was 1.9 percentage points better with him on the court than off the court. That was in the 80th percentile. So what has happened to Kristaps Porzingis is he's done a much better job in drop coverage over the past few years, really in particular last year. So team shot 41.7% against the Wizards in the short mid-range via cleaning the glass. That was in the 77th percentile. So that's runners, that's floaters, right? Because You can't get to the rim when Kristaps Porzingis is in a drop coverage. So that means a lot of times you're going to have to settle for a runner or a floater if you're a guard. And he does a really good job defending those. The other thing is the long mid-range. Team shot just 38.1% on long mid-rangers. That's outside of 14 feet. That was in the 84th percentile via cleaning the glass. So, and those are shots you actually want to force too, right? Because those are not analytically friendly shots. Those are not efficient shots. So what he does is he blocks off the rim secondarily, that means he's going to force you into difficult runners. And then third, if you want to take a mid-ranger, a long mid-ranger, 14 feet to the three-point line, go ahead and take those. And Porzingis has found a way to really be good and successful in drop coverage. The other thing I'd point out is Kevin O'Connor, of course, part of the Ringer Podcast Network, part of the Ringer, part of Fandle. Everybody knows KOC. He had this great stat. Points allowed per pick and roll last season. Kristaps Porzingis, 0.93. That was fourth in the NBA behind Anthony Davis and you had Steven Adams and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Like that's an elite group of guys that he was behind in terms of the defending the pick and roll. And that would tell you those numbers I laid out in terms of the long mid mid rangers, the short mid rangers, that tells you sort of how he's been effective in the drop coverage. (laughs) Guys are not scoring 0.93 points per pick and roll. That's a really elite number. You're talking about Anthony Davis and Giannis. Anthony Davis has been one of the best defenders in the league really since he set foot in the league. And Giannis is a former defensive player of the year. So he's been really impactful on that side of the floor. So when you look at Kristaps Porzingis, the other element to this with him is think about the history of this Celtics team in terms of the injuries with the big men. Now, Al Horford, outstanding season last year, right? But the issue is he played 30 minutes per game and he's entering his 37-year-old season. We thought, okay, Al shot north of 44% from three-point territory last year. It was his best season in terms of a three-point percentage standpoint. What happened in the postseason? He shot south of 30%. So that threat that you had in terms of a big man spacing the floor, that was non-existent when it came to the postseason with Al Horford, right? So Kristaps Porzingis, 
can shoot threes. He's going to be respected as a three-point shooter, more respected than Al Horford. The other component to this is Robert Williams. So Al Horford is going to be 37. He played too many minutes last year. He played in too many games two years ago. You could see Al Horford, and I know he keeps himself in great shape and all that, but you could see Al Horford falling off. Then when you look at it from the perspective of Robert Williams, he played in 35 games last year. Even the game in the postseason in Game 7, when he was available to play for you against the Miami Heat, what happened to Robert Williams? He was throwing up, right? So even the game that technically was healthy from a body perspective, he couldn't stay in the game because he was throwing up. So the guy is never going to be healthy. So I point that out because I love Robert Williams as a player, but the reason I point that out is we've now gotten to the point where we know Robert Williams is not going to be consistent in terms of his health. So you have a 37-year-old center and a center that the most games he's ever played in a season is 61. So you needed depth at that position. Kristaps Porzingis certainly brings you that. And I know he's had some injury history in terms of he's played in 65 games last season, which was the most he's played in since his second season in the NBA. But it now does feel like he's a couple of years removed from the torn meniscus. He's way past the torn ACL. So maybe now he's starting to come into his own from a health perspective. But the biggest thing here for me is the Celtics were in real trouble when it comes to the center position because they traded for Mike Muscala and they got nothing out of him, right? I mean, he barely played except that one game where he played a million minutes against the Milwaukee Bucks. He wasn't part of the playoff rotation. Luke Cornett, it was like an interesting story early on in the season where Cornett would do that Cornett contest thing where he just kind of jump in the air and hope the guy would miss the shot. And it became like an interesting topic for Celtics conversations. But he's not a guy that's going to give you consistent NBA minutes. And you can't trust the health record of Rob and the age of Al Horford is a scary thing. This is a guy that makes a lot of sense with the Celtics in terms of fitting with this team. Now, I will be interested to see sort of what the starting lineup is going to be. And now it feels like, well, it's a lot easier to determine who the guard's going to be. You start Derek White along with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I personally would start Kristaps Porzingis at the five and Al Horford at the floor at the four, rather, and then when you look at it from that perspective, then you can bring in Robert Williams to play the five. Porzingis pushes over to the four because he can play the four, and then you have a situation where you're reducing Al Horford's minutes. But I do feel like the biggest thing here is, from Brad Stevens' perspective, this was a massive deal, and the fact that he was willing to put Marcus Smart in it tells you how much he valued Kristaps Porzingis. And how much of work they must have done, the Celtics brass, the Celtics front office, in terms of looking into Kristaps Porzingis and making sure they feel good about the health perspective with him going forward. Because this is a massive risk for Brad Stevens to bring in a guy like Kristaps Porzingis. And now this is clearly the other element to this with Marcus Smart now out of the building and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Now this is officially their team. They have to be the leaders of this team. Derek White's not going to do it. He's a quiet guy. Al Horford does it in his own way. But now it is abundantly clear that this is Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown's team. Now, from a talent perspective, it was already their team. But when you just look at it in terms of a personality perspective, now this is on Tatum and now this is on Jalen Brown. I cannot wait to see what they look like with Kristaps Porzingis on the court. I believe he's going to be really impactful for this team. But it is risky. And what we've seen from Brad Stevens so far in his GM career, there hasn't been a lot of risky moves. This is certainly one of them. But man, seven foot three, post him up, baby. Joe Mazzulla is going to have to post this guy up. I can't believe it. Sam Cassell is going to have to tell him, hey, Joe, uh, this is called a post up. I know you guys didn't do this last year, but this is what you're going to have to do going forward. All right, a lot more coming up here. You're going to hear from John Jastrzemski from New York, New York. You're going to hear from Jason Goff from the full go in Chicago. And you're here from the guys from the Philly special As well, you're watching The Local Angle right here on FanDuel TV. What's up, everybody? It's Chris Ryan and Raheem Palmer. We're from the Ringers Philly special, and this is The Local Angle. Raheem, what's going on, man? Life is good right now. I mean, we're... uh... Got a nice little break for the NBA season. We've got the NBA draft tonight. Got to figure out what the Sixers are going to do, though. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, for this local angle bit, I wanted to ask you about some other localities other than Philly, because when you see teams in the Eastern Conference in the mix, making moves, changing their makeup, 
Do you get a little bit jealous because, you know, after all these months of Harden talk back since Christmas of last year, some light Tobias Harris rumors going into the draft. But as of right now, as of draft day, it looks like the Sixers are the Sixers are the Sixers. Got a new coach, but for the most part, we're going to have a lot of the same roster. And when you look around and you see Boston trading for Przingis and getting rid of Marcus Smart, who essentially was their, like, their avatar of Celtics, modern Celtics basketball was Marcus Smart. You look around and you see Miami really in the mix for Dame Lillard. And if Portland goes ahead and drafts Scoot or Brandon Miller tonight, you know, you, we could see the end of the Lillard era in Portland right, right after that. How are you feeling about these other Eastern Conference teams changing who they are while the Sixers are essentially going back to a war with the same guys, but with a different general in Nick Nurse? I am very jealous. And a big reason why I'm jealous is because we saw the way the Sixers team has fizzled out of the postseason the last couple of years. So it feels like we need a change, but unfortunately, the circumstances surrounding doesn't allow us to do anything. We basically are in a position of we have to bring James Harden back and then move from there. And if we can't bring James Harden back, we've got to figure out another plan. So I think we're on pause right now. But when you look at the rest of the Eastern Conference, I look at the Boston Celtics. I like the move that they made. Mm -hmm. I know they lose their heart and soul in Marcus Smart, a guy who, you know, does everything. He's a guy who going to die for loose balls. He's a guy who's going to settle the offense down. He's a guy who's going to play top-tier defense. He was Defensive Player of the Year last year. But I like the move to bring in Porzingis. You add in more rim protection. Obviously, Horford is getting old. Add in a guy who can shoot and space the floor. Add in a guy who can get easier buckets. I think maybe this will empower. Tatum and Brown a little bit more. And it also opens up room for Derek White. Pop father says all the time that Derek White was actually better than Marcus Smart last year. And, you know, maybe this is a way for selling high. And I think this was like the rare win-win-win for a three-team trade because I actually think the Memphis Grizzlies got a lot better. Look at Marcus Smart and Jaron Jackson Jr. They're going to have a top-tier defense. And then you look at the Washington Wizards. They get Tyus Jones back. I think that's a solid fit. But then they also they commit to the rebuild. So I like what everybody did did there. But when it comes to the Sixers, I mean, we're just stuck right now. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there's something about this era of the NBA, this immediate era where you see, you know, Matt Ishbia doing things in Phoenix that, frankly, like are financially reckless. But honestly, it's not my money. And, and if I'm a Phoenix Suns fan. I'm like, you know, we, maybe we're going to have to pay the price for this down the line with this Bradley Beal contract. But right now we have three of the best 30, 40 players in the league starting for us. The Sixers, Josh Harris right now and Daryl Morey, who's a very patient GM, who is not going to make the he's not going to make the deal until it's the right deal. I think we have to just be comfortable with like he's going to wait this out a little bit. And I admire what the Celtics are doing, because like if you've gone to the conference finals as many times and haven't won the championship and you could chalk that up to a bunch of different things, ultimately the, the, the constant is the Brown Tatum smart trio and you're not going to get rid of Tatum and you're not going to get rid of Brown yet. So Marcus is the odd man out there. And I do think that at the end of games, the ball found Marcus smart, like Ryan Rosillo and Bill Simmons always talk about on their podcast. The ball had a tendency to find Marcus Smart, and it was like, that's not the dude you want taking those big shots. You want it in Tatum's hands. You want it in Brown's hands. So it's almost addition by subtraction there. And like you said, Porzingis gives them such like a, a new look to their offense and, and also you know some, some insurance for their front line. Uh, as far as the Sixers go, look, the two names that have been in the mix the most are James Harden and Tobias Harris. This has been... Essentially, everybody on the trade machine or thinking about our free agent and our agency in the cap room, Harden was, at certain points in the last six months, absolutely nailed on to go back to Houston. It was a done deal. People around the league talking about how Harden loves it there. He wants to go back. He feels comfortable there. And now the rumors are suggesting that Harden's going to sign a team-friendly two-year deal or something with Philly. Um... I, ultimately, Raheem, I was wondering, are you just going to be happy to have this this drama over with? I have mixed feelings on it. I mean, I just think the way the season ended so disappointingly, like, you almost want to change. You know, Shield talks about, like, he doesn't want to see James Harden back. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But I, I just think 
we kind of just are in a space to where we have to run it back and then possibly trade bias. I'm just comfortable with, with whatever that Maury does at this point. Obviously, I don't really want Fred Van Vliet as this consolation prize, but I would just hope that Harden comes back so we can have the asset and we can just, you know, try to build around Joel Embiid and James Harden. So that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, the Sixers, like you said, they're a little bit handcuffed to their own roster. Like, they can't really lose Harden for nothing. That would essentially, I, you know, that would basically hang like an albatross over the last few years here of, of Embiid's window, of his prime. Yeah. You know, and if you are... I, I don't want to get worse. Yeah, <laughs> that's, right. That's my thing. Yeah, yeah. I think that what one thing I'm taking out of this playoffs, and, you know, obviously, like, there's so many things about Miami that makes that team so special... There's playoff Jimmy. There's this ineffable heat culture thing. There's the contributions they got from guys that most people who are casual NBA fans would not have been able to pick out of a lineup like Gabe Vincent and Max Struess and those dudes. And they got better when they lost their third best player in Tyler Hero. So it's just like inexplicable in a lot of ways. But one thing that that Miami Cinderella run in the NBA playoffs taught me was that like, honestly, man, you just got to try. You just got to like, like yeah. thing, weird things happen. You know, Giannis hurts his back. You get the right side of the playoff draw, and the next thing you know, you might be three up on the the Celtics. And I know that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, but maybe it's crazy to be a basketball fan. And 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 we've changed the coaching. Uh, Nick Nurse is here. I think that he's going to bring some different ideas. And maybe once Harden settles into, okay, this is where I'm going to be for the next couple of years, they do have the Tobias, which turns into this expiring contract, which does have some value. And you, you get some, some growth from Maxi and some growth from B-Ball Paul, and, and the Sixers are in business next year. And then, I mean, you look at the fact that we got this new CBA coming up, yeah. and I think we're going to be seeing a lot of player movement. So as long as we just get Harden back, we got James Harden, we got Joel Embiid, we got Tyrese Maxey, we have we're going to be a really make, good regular season team. Yeah, we're going to be a good regular season team. And then we have flexibility to make another move that might shake up the table. I mean, because we all know that there's going to be a lot of player movement over the next couple of years. And Maury remaining patient, that's going to give us an edge over other teams. And look, I expect Tobias Harris to be gone. And I expect Maury to make the right decision. I mean, they came out yesterday and said other teams were interested in Tobias. Harris, but the Sixers wanted an outrageous offer. And yeah. I think based on what we've seen from trades, we deserve an outrageous offer. I mean, like, I know Sixers fans don't like Tobias Harris, but when you look at some of the other wings in this, this league, you look at the Cleveland Cavaliers, their wings are awful. Tobias Harris might have helped them win a playoff series against the Knicks in that postseason yeah. last year. So I, I think Maury's going to make the right decision. I think he's going to hold off, and we're going to get the right piece to fit with James Harden. Let's just, for the sake of argument, say Tobias Harris is in the mix to be traded. What is it that you want for him? Because there's a real problem in the NBA right now where I, I think Phoenix is going to experience this coming up this season, but in a lot of different places, you have three huge contracts at the top of the, of the roster, and what you essentially always wind up having is a very overpaid third option, which is essentially, Tobias arguably is the overpaid fourth option at this point because of the emergence of Maxi, who the Sixers are also going to have to pay. So if, let's say you get rid of Tobias, is it a one-for-one -one situation? Are you looking to get like another huge contributor or do you want to chop Tobias up into different pieces and have more of a Miami Heat plug and play? Let me get a Martin twin. Let me get a little bit of like this and a little bit of that. Like what kind of thing do you want back for Tobias? If he is actually going to be traded. I'm leaning towards, you know, chop it up into different pieces. So a guy like buddy Hill, like he would fit seamlessly with Joel Embiid and James Harden, a guy who doesn't need the ball in his hands. Now, obviously you, you take on like a guy like buddy Hill, you lose what Tobias Harris has. He's a guy who can put the ball on the floor and get his own shot. But when you're playing next to Joel Embiid and James Harden, there's not a lot of opportunities for that. Unless, yeah, you know, you need a guy who's like injured. comfortable in the corner and waiting for the ball yeah. to rotate to him. So like a, a Harrison Barnes type. Like, like, and I'm not sure if, you know, Sacramento is willing to part with him. And I mean, obviously, I think Tobias is the better player, but you know, pieces like him, 
uh, a Dorian Finney Smith. And oh, see, I, I that, think this, now you're speaking my language. DFS would yeah. be like <laughs> because what I'm worried about with somebody like Buddy is for whatever you get in shooting, you lose in defense, and we are not in the. Yeah, I don't feel like the Sixers are in a place where they can keep sacrificing perimeter defense, and you can only count on Embiid for so much, as we have yeah, seen I agree over and that. over again. It's like for as good as he is at the rim, and for as good as he is as an insurance policy in the back in the, in the front court, like it doesn't matter if dudes are getting free runs at the basket, you know, like yeah. it's it's going to catch up with us. So Tobias, not exactly an all defensive player, but like could hold his own in places and could guard a couple of different kinds of player. I think if you bring in Buddy, man, like you're really then you we need to be scoring 129 points a night. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Nets have like 15 million wings, so it's like Dorian right. Finney Smith on our team would be like perfect because he yeah. could just sit, sit in the quarter, shoot threes, and then he'll defend. Yeah, so it's just like I think we need pieces like that. I so that's what I think. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens with this draft tonight. I think that this draft is all of a sudden, it was kind of a little bit quiet leading up to it. I think is somewhat the Victor stuff has made the draft such a foregone conclusion. But now all of a sudden things have gotten really interesting. You see a bunch of teams with a bunch of picks in the first round. You see a bunch of teams nosing around, trying to get into the top three, get into the top four or five. A couple of these like players like Cam Whitmore, shout out to Villanova, have gotten a little bit bigger profile right now. So I'm really excited to see what happens on draft night. Reem, it was great to talk to you, man. We'll be uh, in touch once we hear about what's going to happen with Tobias Harris, and we'll recap what the Sixers did, if anything, on draft night. Welcome on in to episode 257 of the Full Go Podcast. I'm Jason Goff. Of course, we are brought to you by the Ringer Spotify is the gang. And shout out to FanDuel TV because we're going to start off with the local angle. Hey, we got two baseball winners in the same evening. Now, one is in Pittsburgh. One is here in the city of Chicago. But we have some entertaining baseball. And we all know here in the city that uh, both these teams are underwhelming and the divisions that they play in are trash as well. But yeah, if you fast forward... And you look at what this month of June can be for both these teams, they got a chance to make some hay here. I mean, the White, the White Sox, let's face it, the White Sox have been as inconsistent and as miserable as any team in all of baseball that has any expectations. But over this last couple of weeks or so, they found their power stroke, pause, and of course, they've all been solo home runs because that's what the White Sox do. They do not get on base. <laughs> they do not draw, you know, uh, deep counts. They don't They don't make work, pitchers work a whole lot, right? You know, Eloy Jimenez, who hit a, a, a first run, well, first inning, I should say, two-run bomb, has been uh, very pool happy as of late, but – he goes the other way. Next thing you know, he hits a home run, starts the game off the way he's supposed to. Dylan Cease, like, we've been waiting for Dylan Cease to turn into Dylan Cease of last year. You know, Cy Young candidate Dylan Cease. And the, the starts have been up and down a little bit. He's kind of stabilized it over the last three outings. But Dylan Cease got into a little jam in the fifth inning. Yeah, uh, you know, as as Hawk Harrelson was apt to say all the time, the leadoff walk. It'll kill you. And that's what happened in that fifth inning. He walked the guy, came around to score. He left with a 4-2 lead, right? So you're like, all right, let's see how this one's going to be pissed away. And then the White Sox bullpen came in and said, hey, Jay, we got you. <laughs> we got you. But shout out to Gregory Santos, by the way. Gregory Santos, I think, is turning into uh, something that the White Sox are going to have to count on going down the stretch if an arm gets a little you know, clunky or if somebody just falls off the cliff. I like what I've seen out of him. The dude has not had a, uh, a, coming into this game, has not had a single ball barreled up on him all season long and a, and a bunch of appearances. So the White Sox bullpen uh, was a little shaky, right? Keenan Middleton did not hold it down. A bases loaded situation. Elvis Andrews botches a double play. Um, you know, at some point you feel like something is going to fail you as a White Sox fan because they've been inconsistently consistent all season long, whether it be the starting pitching in certain bouts, the relief pitching in certain bouts, base running, all the things that we've talked about, poor at bats. But in this game, which I thought was a marvelously entertaining game, we got to get to right where we – I think all of Major League Baseball over the next couple of days will be talking about this play where Jonah Hine is, uh, is, is blocking the plate 
as Elvis Andrews is rounding third base. He's sent by Rodriguez. Jankowski is out there in, in left field. He throws a seed. It beats Andrews. Andrews makes a terrific slide. Jonah Heim, you know, it's a bang-bang play. But they go to the ruling, and the call is overturned because he's called out at home, right? This is, it's a tie game if he's called out because Elvis Andrews had a terrific bat. He scored, you know, he's a two-run scoring at bat the, the previous at bat, and then he ends up on third, messes around, comes around, makes it to home plate. Jonah Heim is just got a toe on home plate, and they call catches interference. Now, I thought it was an awful call by the rules, okay? And this is one of those things where you're going by a rule, but it's an awful rule, right? Like, you know, a 40-mile-an-hour speed limit. Like, who needs those? Like, kick it up to 50 so we can all get to where the f*** we got to go, right? But he steps on the plate just a little bit, and then all of a sudden, the people in New York at the replay booth say, guess what? Alvis Andrews is safe. The White Sox go up 7-6, and Bruce Bochy storms, well, not storms out because Bruce Bochy ain't storming out anywhere these days. Bruce Bochy saunters out. He gets himself ejected. Uh, that Rangers team, though, by the way, and, and speaking of Bruce Bochy, you know, he sat around for a few years with no one kicking the tires on a World Series winning manager in terms of, hey, you want to come, you kind of want to come? Coach on the south side? You want to come manage on the south side? But I digress. Bruce Bochy gets thrown out. Kendall Graveman comes in, and uh, he, he nails it down, right, right? No Liam Hendricks right now. He's on the injured list. So the White Sox bullpen could have been the culprit, but I thought a terrific outing by Gregory Santos, uh, followed up by Kendall Graveman, and, of course, the Elvis Andrews at bat. Elvis Andrews going up against his former team, right? I mean, they, they scored three runs in the bottom of the eighth inning. This is not a White Sox team that we've known to rally, right? This is not a White Sox team that we've known to battle a whole bunch when it comes to at-bats. Hell, even Tim Anderson got in the game. You know, he had a pinch hit uh, productive out where he got the runners over to second and third. The other thing, too, though, is, yeah, you know, I know I know he had Father's Day off, and I know Juneteenth was yesterday, but uh, at some point here, you know, come on through, Tim. You know, <laughs> if you can pinch hit, bro, like, we need you out here. At some point, go ahead and play shortstop. Like, don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about the off-field stuff. Just go ahead and jump in at shortstop for me. Because I need, well, one, I need Tim Anderson to be back at shortstop. Two, if this Tim Anderson thing is done, uh, his numbers ain't going to get no better being on the bench, right? So Tim Anderson gets himself a productive out in a pinch hit bid. Uh, this this was, a, you know, an uplifting game because this division is <laughs> and they're only, what, four and a half games, four games out of first place because the Minnesota Twins are sitting at 36 and 38. Like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about in baseball right now? When the Minnesota Twins are leading a division that people thought would be stacked with talent and competitive this year, right? The Guardians are calling up their ace prospect, right? Like, this, this whole thing screams of, if you're any damn good, please show me right now, White Sox. Please. If you're any good. Because this was an entertaining baseball game. Right? I'm, I'm sitting here tearing up because, like, my allergies for one. And for two, I haven't seen a White Sox game where I actually could get into it from pitch one to the end. So that's what happened tonight. And then, <sighs> baseball is so weird to me because every year you have to declare whether you think your team is in it or not by the trade deadline, no matter what you set your sights out to start the season with. The Chicago Cubs right now are playing some pretty damn good baseball. Eight and two in the last 10. Marcus Stroman might start the All-Star game, y'all. He might start the All-Star game. And this is the seventh straight quality start. He goes out there, seven innings pitched, scoreless baseball. He's out. There. And the, the, the thing that I love the most about it is we don't have as many characters in sports as we used to. And Marcus Stroman is a character, top to bottom. Whether it's the do rag, whether it's the swag, where it is the, you know, the dances after strikeouts. Like, I love all of it, right? And, and, you know, a former Cubs manager, Joe Madden, is on record as not liking it and, you know, crying about old baseball all over. Who'd have thought the dude who had like chips and magicians and funny dress up days in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in the clubhouse would be mad about dudes gyrating on the mound, right? But I tried to warn y'all about him. I tried to warn y'all about him when he was here, you know, what he really cared about. And we come to find out this is pretty much Joe Madden is what he cared about. But I digress. 
The Cubs are playing really good baseball as of late. The offense, I mean, Danzy Swanson, you know, we haven't talked about it a lot because we haven't talked a lot of baseball in the pod, but Danzy Swanson has been everything and more that you could ask for. You know, whether it's getting hit by pitches in this game, playing damn good defense, um, really, really good at bats. You know he's going to play every single day. Nico Horner is right on the verge of being one of my favorite baseball players in this city. So, you know, this this, this Cubs thing is so weird because of the nature of baseball, you have to declare what you are at the be- at the trade deadline. Even if it strays from what you thought you might be at the beginning of the season, they might have to trade Marcus Stroman. They might have to trade some of these other pieces because you have to declare. Now, the Reds have won 10 games in a row. The Brewers are faltering. Um, the Cubs are a few games back in uh, first place. Do I think the Cubs can win this division? I, I'm not sure. I don't think either one of these teams should win a division, but the divisions that they play in are just bad enough. So when we see the, you know, the abats that are being put together by the Seiya Suzuki's as of late, by Nico Horner and, and Danzy Swanson at the top of that lineup, and then you got Marcus Stroman doing what he's doing. You got Justin Steele who just came back, who's looking like, you know, what people thought he would look like. Uh, you know, Drew Smiley is doing what he needs to do at the back end of that rotation. You know, it, it could be an eventful summer. There could be meaningful baseball played on both sides of town the final month of the season. It's just you have to declare at the trade deadline. So that means you can't trade Dylan Cease or Lucas Gilito or, you know, whoever else, Tim Anderson, if you think you are in it. But the question still begs, even if you win a division, what are you truly winning with the way that you play baseball, especially on the south side? The White Sox have the fifth worst run differential in all of the major leagues right now. That does not spell playoff success to me, but they're only four and a half, four games out. So as the weirdness of the summer continues and Chicago baseball carries on, I'm enjoying the, the you know, the, the night's few and far between that both get a win, but both play entertaining baseball, both play engaging baseball. Some of those White Sox losses are pure dreck from start to finish. This wasn't one of them tonight. And, of course, on the north side of town, Marcus Stroman continues his Cy Young-type bid. Now, will he be a Chicago Cub after the trade deadline? We're going to find out what Jed Hoyer and the boys really think over there because now you're supposed to start spending money on this team, right? Now every offseason is supposed to be adding, right? Not just say a Suzuki, not just Anthony Swanson, but you're supposed to be kicking the tires on some big-name free agents. What are you telling not only your organization and your roster, but your fan base if you have a guy who's pitching like a Cy Young candidate but ends up in another jersey because you flipped him because he's, his trade value was high? So this is the conundrum that I think both sides of town are finding themselves on. I'm just thankful that we got ourselves some meaningful and fun and engaging baseballs. This way, I didn't have to cry about White Sox baseball, and I didn't have to tell y'all I didn't watch the Cubs. So shout out to the local angle. Hope you enjoyed it because I definitely know I enjoyed it tonight. Welcome back to the local angle right here on FanDuel TV. I'm John Jastrzemski, the host of New York, New York. And it's draft week in the NBA. And I'm not going to lie, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. In many ways, I'm kind of relieved over the fact that the New York Knickerbockers are not going to be picking with their own first round pick. And they made that trade to go and get Josh Hart, which obviously worked out very well for them. He was great in the second half of the year. He was instrumental in their first-round series win over the Cleveland Cavaliers. So obviously no regrets about bringing Mr. Hart into the fold. Good move all in all by the New York Knicks. But I think about the last 25 or so years of my life and draft lottery night and draft night have brought about a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of anguish, a whole lot of agita when it comes to the basketball team that I root for. And it's kind of cringeworthy in a way to go through a bunch of these quote-unquote draft busts that have happened or situations and circumstances and everything that comes with being a New York Knicks fan 
go through the laundry list of draft picks and whiffs and just a swing and a miss, a swing and a miss, and a swing and a miss when it comes to the franchise. And, and it might cause you to drink here uh, on this Friday, but that's par for the course. And that's what we're going to have a little fun with here going through. And I'm going to say for the last 25 years of my life, draft bus. Starting with five, going all the way down to one from a New York Knicks perspective. So, number five on this list for me is going to be Jordan Hill. And the reason I'm putting Jordan Hill number five on this list is because it was the 2009 draft. And I remember it well. There were two guys I really wanted from a Knicks perspective. One would have made me look like I was Red Auerbach and I was Pat Riley in my prime. The other would have made me look like David Kahn. But that was the year in which there were two guys, and I watch a lot of college basketball, that I fell in love with. One was at my alma mater, Syracuse, Johnny Flynn, who was a tremendous point guard for the Cues. The other happened to be the sensation of the 2008 NCAA tournament. He came back, played the next year at Davidson, put up big numbers. Team didn't go dancing. But that would be one Steph Curry. And I remember on draft night, as I'm guzzing beers and eating wings and getting barbecue sauce all over my face, I'm watching the draft saying, poise. can the New York Knicks end up with one of these two? Flynn or Curry? Well, Flynn goes higher than Steph Curry, which now is crazy to think about on a variety of different levels. But, okay, Johnny Flynn's off the board. He went a lot higher than I thought he was going to go. But now the stage is set. Curry's going to be there for the Knicks. Come on. He's going to be there for the Knicks. Never in a million years thought he'd turn into what he has turned into, but I'm like, this guy's going to be good in the NBA. You're one measly pick away. The Golden State Warriors end up with Stephen Curry. The New York Knickerbockers end up with Jordan Hill. Enough said. Enough said. So that falls onto the list because... It will forever be the pick that, like, got away. It was just all so close. It was right in front of your face, and it didn't end up happening. Number four on this list is Michael Sweeten. Now, in the Knicks' defense, the 2003 draft is an all-time draft with LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Like, you got four Hall of Famers and future Hall of Famers right then and there. The Knicks were not picking at the top of the draft. So they didn't have the chance to go and get Melo originally or to go get Wade or go get Bosch or LeBron. They they weren't in that position. But it's very much on brand for the Knicks in a loaded top five of a draft to be picking towards the back half of the top 10 and to end up with the immortal Michael Sweetney. Michael Sweetney, an undersized power forward out of Georgetown. Michael Sweetney, who, no disrespect, amounted to absolutely nothing as far as NBA success is concerned. Yeah, I think it's fair to say, well, the draft, Knicks end up with a dud. We got to put Michael Sweetney on that particular list. All right, number three on this wonderful trip down memory lane, Kevin Knox. Remember when Kevin Knox, oh, he's can't miss shooter. John Calipari loves him. He's going to fit beautifully, beautifully, beautifully into the modern-day NBA. The Knicks choose Kevin Knox. And you know who they bypassed? I'll give you two guys. One, they bypassed the guy by the name of SGA. Wouldn't SGA look pretty darn nice in a New York Knickerbocker uniform right about now? I'd say so. Michael Porter Jr., who, full disclosure, was the guy I wanted the New York Knickerbockers to take because, yes, there were the injury concerns, but I said, hey, you're the Knicks. At this point in time, the Knicks were a joke. They stunk. They should have been swinging for the fences as far as lottery picks are concerned. Why the hell not? Roll the dice. Porter was the guy I wanted. Now, in hindsight, SGA is going to end up being the guy that could have been a game changer and is now flourishing with the Oklahoma City Thunder and had an all-NBA season. But Michael Porter Jr. would have been a tremendous pick. 
would have been a winning player, would have fit in really nicely with what the Knicks have right about now. Instead, the Knicks go with Kevin Knox. Kevin Knox, who is the summer league standout, gave you zero. As a wing and a guy who was supposed to hit the three-point shot. No, he's banished the boogie land as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. Thanks for that one, guys. Really appreciate that pick. Number two, and, and this is one that ended up being the ultimate parting gift from Phil Jackson. And listen, Phil Jackson is an all-time great NBA head coach. Chicago, Los Angeles, the triangle offense. I'll never knock Phil as a coach. As an executive, he's one of the worst executives in the history of the New York Knicks. There's, there's no getting around that. And the mistakes are endless from Phil's standpoint. Being as stuck in his ways as he was was embarrassing. But I went to a game at the Carrier Dome. Again, sometimes it comes full circle with Syracuse with me. And I watched Donovan Mitchell light up the Carrier Dome light up the 2-3 zone. He's got ties to the New York area. He's got ties to all the factories, the AAU, you name it. It's like, it's a local kid. His dad works for the Mets. Like, come on. Talk to Patino. Patino will give you the resume, for goodness sakes. Instead of going with Donovan Mitchell, the Knicks go and take Frank Neil Aquino, the Frenchman. And it was embarrassing how many shills out there tried to make the argument, oh, you're going to see, he's going to translate, he's going to work, he's going to be a defensive whiz, a standout. Some people even put Tony Parker in the same sentence, which is insulting to Tony Parker. And Frank Neil Aquino was an absolute stiff. His offensive game stunk. His defense was overrated. I got to watch Donovan Mitchell. Now, the Knicks did beat Donovan Mitchell, and Jalen Brunson outplayed Donovan Mitchell. So there's that. But could have had him from his rookie year on. I could have had somebody that could have penalized me and wowed me and opened my eyes a little bit. Instead, I got to watch Frank Villacino. So thanks, Phil Jackson. Thanks. Phil Jackson's going to have a hard time getting a drink in New York City. Chicago, no problem. Los Angeles, no problem. New Yorkers? No, not so much. Last but not least on this list. And this is one that will continue to haunt me. And I think this particular player might still be haunted by getting posterized by Vince Carter in the Olympics. But as a kid growing up in New York City, Ron Artest was a dude. Played for St. John's. They had success in the NCAA tournament. Got after it on defense, play with an edge, killer instinct. Like, Ron Artest was there to be had for Nick team that was looking to kind of keep their run extended. Not saying they would have necessarily been able to do that. Ewing's demise, the whole deal. But I'm like, okay. They got a chance to go and get themselves a New York City kid who could be here for a while. And I'm like, they're going to take our test. There's no way in the world they're not going to take our test. This is pre-social media. This is pre-Twitter. This is pre uh, uh, a lot of stuff. I think it's pre-Facebook. You name it. I don't even think you had a MySpace page back when Ron Artest got drafted. Remember those MySpace pages? I can't believe I dropped that reference just now. But anyway, Artest is going to be the pick. And I got to hear David Stern go, Frederick Weiss. Frederick Weiss. I'll say it one more time for you. Frederick Weiss. Guy never played a game with the Knicks. Was Stiff doesn't even begin to describe the ineptitude of watching that guy on an NBA court or try to play against NBA players in the Olympics. He never made his way onto an NBA court. It was such a big joke. And I had to see our test throughout his career. Yes, go through his trials and tribulations, go through his up and downs, but have a winning NBA career, a colorful NBA career. And I will be forever reminded of Frederick Weiss. So if you're wondering why, from a Knicks perspective, I'm happy the franchise didn't have a first-round pick, at least their own, 
I know it's a loser mentality. I know it's loser logic, but I gave you those top five busts right there. And I'm kind of thankful I don't have to relive at least another one of those things. <laughs>